Ben Greenfield back on the show, brother. Whoa. I know, came yeah. in hot there. Here with my giant suitcase. Once again. <laughs> I'm excited, man. I because um, well, listen, I've I've been a fan of your content for, for a long time, but I've been devouring it lately. Ever since you came on the show, I'm like, and with everything going on in the world, I'm like, okay, I got to go to who I, who can I trust here during all this chaos? And I've been reading mm-hmm. a lot. I've been reading your book. The thing is like a fucking Bible, by the way. It's you know, it's not a it's not a light read. Mm, no, it's kind of heavy. How yeah. long did it take you yeah. to write that? What was I've, your? I'm just hoping my readers get more fit picking it. My up. My biceps are stronger from just mm-hmm. picking up that thing. Right. Did, did you have like a, a, a schedule? <laughs> like, was there like a schedule that you wrote at the same time every day? Uh, no, no. I'll like write in the back of an Uber and you know underneath a table and just wherever I can here and there. And some days it's 200 words, and some days it's 2,000 words, and that's just how I write because writing isn't my full time job. I wish it was. But I don't know if I'd write that much. You know, you hear about authors who get up in the morning and, you know, and have some emails and then maybe go walk the dog and oh, I got work out. I got this phone call and you get to 3 p.m. and it's finally time to write. And then you open your computer and you write for a little while and then you decide to go make a coffee. And <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I'm not a full time author, so I just write here and there. But three years ago, I wanted to write a book on anti-aging and longevity and all the things that the blue zones are doing, you know, the, the teas and the flavanols and the polyphenols and how much alcohol are they consuming and time in the sunshine and all the natural stuff. But then I was also really interested in, you know, NAD and peptides and a lot of the more advanced anti-aging protocols that we might see in a more, in a more you know, Western type of approach. And the fact is that as I, as I delved into it, began writing the book, you know, fighting aging, you have to take care of the immune system and the gut and the brain barrier and neurotransmitters and hormones and just on and on and on to wound up taking on a life of its own and being more of just like a manual for the human body and brain. And of course, we see in a lot of these blue zones that spirituality is, is heavily tied into anti-aging and longevity, connection with purpose, relationship, union with God, prayer, meditation, journaling, silence, solitude, all, all these spiritual disciplines. So then I wove those into the book. And yeah, it, it, it took a while. I have like, when I write, I have a Google Drive. And I just have a separate folder for each chapter of the book. And then I've got a team of scientific editors and research assistants. And so, you know, some days I'm writing on one chapter. Some days I'm writing on another chapter as new research articles come out or there's things that I want to put in. And then finally, after three years, the manuscript was 1,300 pages long. And then that went on to the publisher. And that was where, you know, we had to cut and cut and cut and it was kind of like kissing babies goodbye, you know, as we'd get rid of little sections. But what I did was I saved everything. So so it's all, when you get the book, there's a secret section of the website where you can go in and just see all the cut material, all the extra hidden resources, because obviously you can't publish a 1,200-page book. Wait, so. I'm writing a book, too, right now, and the publisher and I are having a call today because they want to cut a bunch of stuff, too. Yeah, I wrote, yeah. like, way too much. So you just did, like, a secret situation yeah. online. Yeah. So people can go consume more if they want. Right. So so every I'm time. Do that. So so if everything's in the cloud, right, and you're writing your book and someone's editing a chapter in let's say a Google Doc, an online Google Doc, then the first version of that Google Doc is something you can save and then you send them a backup version of that. They edit that. And so I have like V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 Sorry. of each chapter. And so at the very end of the book, I just put V1 of each chapter online. So anybody who gets the book can go in, type in a little password, and, and if they want to, you know, 650 pages wasn't enough for them, they can go knock themselves out with more. Well, it- two, two things here. One, <clears throat> one, I love your book because the way that it's written, like you said, it is like a, like a man, like a manual, like you can go in and reference and, you know, somebody that's a novice like me in a lot of these subjects, you read a book front to back and it's like, that was so overwhelming. How do I remember? But what I like is you can tap into each chapter and be like, okay, what did he say about this specific thing, whether it's sleep or my gut or whatever. And so you can go back and use it as a reference, which is amazing because like, it's a, if you're just getting started on this stuff and like trying to figure things out, like having to go and pick up some long textbook with all these different highlight pages, it's hard to figure out contextually like where you are. But with yeah. this, you can actually go into like, okay, right now I'm having trouble with sleep. Let me go into the sleep chapter or sex. Yeah. Let me go to the sex chapter, et yeah. cetera. Well, well, A, I, I did want it to be kind of a cookbook where if you're having difficult with sleep, say you go and just go through the sleep chapter. Or if you're super interested in, let's say, all the anti-aging and longevity secrets, you, that chapter is like 120 pages long. Uh, but then B, I feel really self-conscious right now 
that this this is me pimping and it being a giant commercial for my book. So no, no, no. It's, <laughs> don't feel self conscious, and <laughs> no, I'll tell okay. you why. It brought Michael so I much feel value. Self conscious when I'm talking about it. Like no, that. I was. My next question was actually going to be about the book. I just wanted to know if there was like. I wouldn't have let in so hard about the book if I wasn't yeah. such a it's fan. It's so of good. Check no, it. I, I watched him study it and bookmark it and dog ear it, and I I would pick it up and just open a page and just start reading about it. Michael's learned so much. He has like a whole vitamin thing now with his like little fridge, a mini fridge in his bathroom. Mm-hmm. He's having those minerals every single morning. Well, I needed to get my shit together because I yeah. was the, falling the, apart. The Quinton minerals, yeah. oh, those are amazing. Those are yeah. amazing. Uh, it's, they, I mean, you can you can get, we may have even talked about this last time, like good salt and what the good salts are. And I was talking to one researcher who did a, a mass spectrometry analysis of all the different salts that you could buy at the grocery store. And uh, he looked at the minerals, the microplastics, at the metals. Himalayan salt, like Himalayan pink salt, actually turned out to be kind of high in in iron, which could be problematic, especially for males, because because guys who have iron buildup in their bodies, it can be like internal rust for your body, which is why I think it's important for anybody to test their iron a couple of times a year just to make sure. It's My dad does that. He actually has to get blood removed every couple. Yeah. Well, that's that's the best way to do it. You, yeah. just, you just give blood, you do society a service, and you get rid of some of your extra iron. But the um, the Himalayan salt actually wasn't that great, and uh, there were other salts that were pretty good. But at the top of the list, you know what the best salt was as far as mineral content and purity? Was it the Kintan? No, it was, uh, well, Kintan isn't a salt. It's more like a mineral solution that you're not going to dump that on your food as a, yeah, as yeah, a yeah. spice, though. It was the, the Celtic salt, that you the, you know, the blue bag that you can get at any grocery store, huh. which, which is fantastic for me to know, because if I'm traveling and I throw a bag of salt in my bag, uh, the, you know, TSA always wants to check out the white powders. Yeah. So I, I put baking soda when I'm at home and a glass of water in the morning to kind of alkalize my body a little bit. And it helps with your morning bowel movement. And I put a little vitamin C in there. But a lot of these powders I don't travel with just because it's difficult. But if I go into a city, I can just go to the grocery store and get Celtic salt. How do you use the Celtic, the Celtic salt? Mm-hmm. How do you use it? I sprinkle it on food. I put it in a morning glass of water. It's just I, salt. Yeah, I probably eat like six to eight grams of salt per day. And, you know, the, the problematic issue with salt is, of course, isolated sodium chloride, which you'd find in table salt. You need to be careful using high amounts of that because it's not accompanied by minerals that help to balance out the sodium. It doesn't have the, the potassium, for example, or 72 other minerals that you're going to find in a lot of better salts. So, uh, you know, in terms of your salt intake, you would want to eat six to eight grams of salt and have it be from sodium chloride. The only good thing, the saving grace of table salt, and this is why as people are getting super picky about salt and getting their, you know, their Florida cell and Kona black salt and all these fancy salts, is the nice thing about table salt is it is pretty high in iodine, right? So if you don't want to get an iodine deficiency and you're switching out from table salt, you may have to include some sea vegetables in your diet like dulce or, or kelp or, you know, or, uh, or nori or just supplement with iodine. Is there iodine in Celtic salt? Not that much. Not, not that not, much. Not compared to iodized table salt. Okay. And, and not everybody needs to consume six to eight grams per day. I, I used to race Ironman triathlon. I did that for like 10 years. And we had a team exercise physiologist who would come in and do what's called a sweat sodium analysis on all the athletes. And I was losing like two and a half times the amount of minerals in my sweat than the average person. And so I started salting heavily, you know, food, putting it in water. The first thing I noticed was I used to lay awake in bed at night and I could hear my blood pounding in my ears just, just because my, my blood pressure was offset by mineral depletion. First thing I noticed, first day I started heavily salting was that went away. And I just thought it was normal. I thought, you know, athletes who train hard can hear their blood pounding in their ears as they fall asleep and it's just something that's part of training hard. And I realized, oh my gosh, I'm just deficient in minerals, which is also important if you're, if you're stressed out, your adrenal glands are a storehouse of vitamin C and of minerals. So one of, the, one of the important things you can do if you're going through a stressful period of time is you wake up in the morning and you take your nice big glass of water and you put a few pinches of, of a good salt in there, like the Celtic salt or some, some of those Quinton minerals that you're using, Michael, and then you add some some good vitamin C, you know, some ascorbic acid, and that, that's a great little morning cocktail for your adrenals. I read about that Quinton stuff, that the family that developed it, they, mm-hmm. like, they've had the like proprietary blend or formula or however mm-hmm. they made it for years, like nobody knows how to make it but them. Yeah, they harvest it from from algal blooms. And if you're in LA, you can get it at Moon Juice. You can they have it's like a little vial. Um, yeah. do you it come, like comes the little in a sachet and then like a little glass vial? Yes. Yeah. Do you like those little um packets of vitamin C? The what's the brand? 
that we have? I don't. I, I kind of. They're stop. little tiny packets of vitamin C, or do you like like Quicksilver better? I the one that I use right now, I think, is Jigsaw Health. It's called their. It's actually called, I think, Adrenal Cocktail, and it's a powder. It's a little sachet of powder, and I like that because I can travel with it, or just you know, I, I've got a tub of it at home, so I just put a couple scoops from the tub. But then when I travel, I use their little sachets. But you just want to look for good, you know, non-GMO uh, ascorbic acid. Well, I think when it, when it comes to, to you and your content, the reason I think I identify, we, you know, we talk to people all the time on this show, all walks of life, and, and people that do similar things or try to do similar things that you do. Like, let's talk about like a broad range of health and wellness and, and, and biohacking, all these things. But like, you know, you talk to a lot of these experts and either they, you know, don't walk the walk and are, you know, out of shape themselves. And I'm, I'm not singling anybody out. Or, you know, maybe they haven't researched. And what I like about your content is it's super heavily, I mean, it's extremely heavily researched. You always have all these different uh, references and resources and articles and people. And then you yourself obviously are a practitioner of a lot of these things. It sounds like you try most of the things you talk about first before you start talking about them, at least in what I've seen. And yeah. so like, it's what I, what I like to do is say like, Hey, there's somebody that's heavily researched and they've also tried it and they've also had success with it and like to me that those are like the three things you need in order to be a, a credible source for a lot of this stuff because there's so much information out there and when you're talking over here you're like you know what we try to do is on this show is is zone it in to say like okay these are the people you should listen to and these are the ones like maybe be cautious of but presenting everybody but also you know putting that disclaimer out there and saying like be careful who you're listening to and how yeah and, and that's not to say that you know who's a the you know short little white haired five foot five basketball coach he's a great basketball coach you know he's bringing a dunk a basketball and I know some wonderful you know functional medicine practitioners who are you know technically on paper they're probably overweight or mildly obese yet you know they've kind of sacrificed themselves to a certain extent to help others and so I you know I, I think in some cases someone cannot be walking the walk so to speak and still be a good source of information but this this is advice for anybody writing a book People relate to stories. Yes. Right? People relate to someone coming out from the trenches or the field and say, okay, here's what I've experienced and here are the things I learned. And I tried to do that in the book was start with a personal anecdote or a story. You know, my, my children, they, they do a book report every week. I, I think that there are, there's kind of like five key things that I focus on in my kids' education that, that I think would serve anyone well in life, whether you're going into engineering or law or medicine or anything like that. And it is uh, reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, logic, and or computer programming, and then uh, rhetoric and or persuasion, right? Like those, those kind of five key things, reading, writing, arithmetic, logic, and rhetoric, I think are, are really good things for a kid to learn early on in life. I think it, it prepares them well for just about any career. And uh, as part of the reading and the writing component, we go down to the big bookshelf in the basement and books are highly prized in our house. Like if there's downtime in our house, usually the TV's not on, there's not a lot of screen time. Some, we typically all have our noses in a book or, or we're playing music like on, on a musical instrument, like a guitar or a uke or the piano or whatever. But I take my kids down to the, the basement and I let them select a book, like any book from all of dad's books that they get to read anything that kind of piques their interest because I, I really try to let them pursue their passions and interests and what it is that they're actually curious about that's kind of the way that we that we school them and then they take that book and their job is to spend a week reading that book and then at the end of the week write a quick little one to two page book report so i, I think reading is kind of like a muscle and as they're as they're going through life i mean if they can read 50 plus books a year that's great, especially when they're reading the books that I've already read with the pages folded over and the stuff that I think is really important highlighted. So they're kind of like seeing it filtered through dad's eyes and, and kind of seeing the stuff that I thought was really important in the book. And then their job is to write that book report. And I always tell them, write that book report from your perspective, tell your stories, talk about how you learn. You know, if you're reading this book on breathing, you know, how did you use that breath work? Did you, did you try it at night and see if it helped you to fall asleep faster or before a workout to see if it amped you up, you know, tell stories. And I think if you're going to write a book, you want to be able to give your own personal experiences, your own personal stories. And so there's that. And then I also do agree that, that to a certain extent, like I'm going to, I'm not going to tell people to go put eight grams of baking soda in their morning glass of water without realizing myself that if you use too much, you're going to like paint the back of the toilet seat, with <laughs> liquid poo coming out your backside, you know, if you, if you overdo it. So I tell people, you know, start with, you know, three or four grams and up it to bowel tolerance. And here's what happened to me when I took too much. So yeah, I think, I think personal experience is important. Yeah. I want to know with everything that's going on in the world, 
COVID, everything. If you were to tell our audience to do three things differently in their daily routine, little habits that they could add, what would those three things be? Oh, geez, you got to give me a number three. You can do um, you can do five. Well, yeah, well, well, I, I can tell you what I started doing okay. when, when this whole pandemic began. And I'm not a doctor. I like, don't misconstrue this as medical advice. I'm not, you know, saying any of this stuff is a is a COVID cure or preventive or anything like that. Uh, however. I was already taking care of my immune system and I actually had already written the immune system chapter of the book and kind of wished after this whole, it's the first thing I want to talk about. Never get sick chapter. Right. 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 Because, you know, I started learning about all these other new things from functional medicine docs in my network who I bounce things off of, you know, about peptides like thymus and alpha one that they're using for acute COVID and, you know, some of the the ozone and, uh, and the, the nebulized glutathione, all, all this, crazy stuff that even goes beyond what I went into in the immune system chapter of the book. But I was already taking care of my immune system, right? I I was using vitamin C and and a little bit of zinc and selenium and, you know, having a decent amount of flavanols and polyphenols and and antioxidant rich herbs and spices in my diet. I was paying attention to my, my bacterial status, eating a wide variety of fermented foods just because so much of your immune system resides in your gut and doing a lot of things to care for my body. But when the, when the pandemic struck, I did add in a few things. Uh, I got uh, an, an ozone generator because it turns out that that ozone can be extremely So So what, what is an ozone generator? Ben, exactly? do you have to do this to my husband? He's bought every <sighs> fucking contraption. He has the chili pad. He has a, his mm-hmm. new fridge. He has all these yeah. new machines. And now he's going to well, go and order yeah. this ozone so, thing. How so big now, is this? Now you guys got to build new shed. Oh. No, it's it's small. It's it's like the size of a uh, you know, like like a laptop, you know, like around that size. Okay. And so um, I I started drinking ozonated water in the mornings just just to help to to kill off anything that that could be in the digestive tract. And it turns out that ozone is actually really really good for immunity. The other thing that I started doing, especially when I travel, was they sell these things called nebulizers on Amazon. Yep. And you you breathe nebulized whatever it is you're nebulizing in that little little portal that you put into the nebulizer into your respiratory tract into your nasal passages. So I started nebulizing uh, glutathione and silver as as just like something I would breathe in during the day while I'd be working on emails or working on my laptop. And when I travel, I have a little portable nebulizer that I use. So the only things I changed I started using ozone. I started nebulizing and then. With my kids, we, we did this for six weeks in a row just because we were stuck at home during this pandemic was we did a bunch of sauna and breath work. So we were in the sauna, sweating out toxins, you know, making the cells more resilient via the production of these heat shock proteins that a sauna does for you. And then we did a lot of breath work, like breath holds, holding on carbon dioxide, breathing in nitric oxide or activating nitric oxide production by breathing through our nose. And so we did sauna and breath work, and then we'd always finish with a quick cold, like a cold tub soak, which is also really good for the immune system. And so I started doing those things on a really regular basis, ozone, nebulizing, and then sauna and breath work. So I want to unpack this a little bit, and I want to go, kind of go back to basic because, like, if we're getting to the advanced levels, right? Like, we, I, I did kind of just jump straight into. No, but that's that okay because products. I mean, I think like the, for people that are already taking care of the immune system right. in advance, like these are great things, and I'm actually going to look into it myself now. But um, oh, and now we're going to have a sauna too. But like, but. If, if you're, let's say, you're a young person, you're in, you know, a metropolitan city, mm-hmm. and you need to, and you're just like, I want to start getting my immunity under control. And right. We don't have to go back and hash about COVID now. We've had right. plenty of doctors on the show saying like, hey, maybe this thing's not going away, and even if there is a vaccine, like maybe you don't get it, like maybe it's not effective. Yeah. And so I think the bigger thing that we're trying to champion here um, with people like yourself is to say, okay, the biggest thing you got to focus on right now is boosting your immunity. That should be a right. given any time right. of life, pandemic, no yeah. pandemic. And like, what are the basic right. things the, here? I know you really- basics. The basics, uh, we, we know that air pollution or, or just not breathing clean air can predispose you or, or put you at higher likelihood of contracting COVID. So make sure that you know you you're you're breathing good, clean, pure air. If you have the ability to have like a HEPA air filter or something like that in your bedroom or your office, that's important. Uh, we also know that inflammation and overweight or obesity are both associated with increased susceptibility. So make sure you're not eating a lot of foods that would inflame the body, particularly vegetable oils and processed sugars or processed carbohydrates. Try to cut those out of the diet as much as possible. And of course, when it comes to the obesity or overweight, 
exercise and preferably exercise outdoors because we know that there's some protective effects of UVA and UVB from sunlight. A lot of times there are fewer aerosolized particles outdoors. We see a lot fewer instances aside from some of the protests that have happened recently where a whole bunch of people are in one place of people getting sick by being outdoors. So tackle inflammation with, your, with, with a dietary approach and then also make sure that you're exercising preferably outdoors in the sunshine. And then as far as nutrients go that we know can help to protect you or upregulate your immune system, it would be vitamin C, zinc, selenium, quercetin is really good. The EGCG and that matcha Is there a specific brands you like for, for these? That would be really good. Wait, can we go over e- just really quick each of these which brands? So say that again because I'm even writing this down. So okay. say it again. So vitamin C, we already talked about that. And there's a lot of different brands. Of course, you know, there are foods like, you know, kiwi fruit and tart cherries that, that are also very rich in vitamin C. So, you know, eating a diet that's widely varied in, in dark, colorful plant matter is going to get you a lot of vitamin C. Uh, liposomal vitamin C, if you're going to take it orally, appears to be one of the better ways to go as far as bioavailability. That's the one I was, that's you like the Quicksilver? One, yeah. And uh, Quicksilver does one. Okay. Uh, Jigsaw Health uh, also does one. Okay. And you can dose it multiple times per day. That appears to, to be the best way to kind of keep vitamin, vitamin C. C okay, levels. so vitamin C check. Off. That's, okay. we, we know that. What's the next one? Uh, zinc and zinc. selenium okay. and uh, life extension makes these zinc acetate lozenges that you can dissolve in your mouth so the zinc is kind of getting into your respiratory tract a little bit that's a good one although i i have a, a different hack for zinc and uh, i i use this pre-workout this stuff called black ant powder and this is kind of fringe but <laughs> it's amazing for like libido stamina endurance because it's from i, I ants, heard about right? this the it's whole, just blended ants yeah the whole doctrine of signatures thing right like things that are innate like you know walnuts look like a brain and they're good for cognitive function and you know pomegranates when we cut them open they look like a the atrium and, and, and ventricles of, or the atrium and ventricles of the heart so those are kind of good for cardiovascular function but it turns out that the um the black ant you know gives you gives you a lot of stamina but it's also like 10 times higher in zinc than shellfish so that's a really good source of zinc. And of course, shellfish are also a really good source of zinc. Okay. And then uh, selenium. There's a lot of manufacturers. Uh, Thorn does a really good job uh, with, with a lot of their supplements. So, What do you think about beer. raw Brazilian nuts, three of them for selenium a day? That's a pretty good source of selenium. Okay. But be careful because Brazil nuts tend to get moldy really easily. Okay. So keep them in the freezer. Oh, guaranteed. You have, the, the you have moldy nuts. So I've been nuts. eating mold. Okay. Guaranteed, yeah. because you, she you, never puts anything yeah, away. Yeah, and you can do the sniff test. It's like the sniff test on fish oil. If it smells all fishy, it's probably rancid and oxidized, and you should keep your fish oil in the refrigerator or the freezer. With Brazil nuts, same thing. If you smell them and they smell kind of off, they probably already wrong. have mold. They just tend to get moldy really easily. Okay. So, um, so the other one, in addition to vitamin C, zinc, and selenium, is uh, quercetin, Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N. Uh, I know some really good docs who are just, you know, sending out like subcutaneous injections of kerosene to get a you know, whole bunch of it all at once. You'll find kerosene in things like uh, red apples or red onions, but you can also purchase it as a supplement. And there's a lot of good supplement manufacturers out there. I'm not, I'm not beholden to anyone, but you know, Thorn does a good job. Life Extension does a good job. Standard Process is pretty good. Now Foods does good stuff. Um, From so, what I've heard, it's hard to go wrong with Thorn. Yeah, yeah, I I like Thorn, and you know they they originally kind of had a lot of brands or products that were marketed heavily to athletes because they are what's called NSF certified for sport, meaning it's less likely to have contaminants in it. But they just they do a really good job. They they have got great manufacturing facilities, and and you know they trace every single bottle back to the original source. So you know what's in it is actually what's in it. And, and you're um, big on colostrum too. Why so? Why so big on colostrum now? Oh, I love colostrum. Colostrum is is you know something that is part of breast milk. You know, it's kind of the. the I can first, give you some. Yeah, yeah. It's, Still, it's it's like nature's first food. It, it helps uh, a baby mammal when they're born to get a lot of growth hormone and growth factors to grow up big and strong. But it also has this interesting effect because a lot of of young mammals are born with a slightly leaky gut, like these slight, slightly open permeable proteins in the gut, and colostrum helps to seal up those linings. And that's also very supportive for the immune system, again, because gut health is so heavily tied into proper immune system function. And you can get colostrum capsules, but the better way to go is colostrum powder, because it turns out if you're using colostrum and you put it into a smoothie and you're kind of like swishing the smoothie around in your mouth, or even if you just like eat it straight out of the jar, 
I think it tastes really good. Actually, it has this nice umami kind of salty flavor. It uh, the the saliva, the salivary enzymes in your mouth help to activate a lot of the growth factors in the colostrum. So if you get colostrum powder and you kind of let it sit in your mouth a little bit, that's really good for the immune system. Although I have to admit that if you if you look at say the Institute for Functional Medicine's website where they have a lot of really good um, peer-reviewed research on, on the type of things that seem to be effective for COVID that would fall more into kind of the, like these natural categories that we're talking about. Colostrum hasn't been studied for that, but you know, it, it is good for the immune system. And then, uh, EGCG, you know, the, the epigallocatechins, I believe is how it's pronounced that you'd find in matcha, like Lauren's drinking over here, or like a really good green tea. That's also very, very good for the immune system, particularly for COVID. So that would be another one that I would, I would consider including. So we've got our vitamin C, zinc, selenium, quercetin, EGCG, colostrum, staying away from inflammatory foods like vegetable oils and processed sugars, and then exercising outdoors in the sunshine. I think those would be some pretty good places to start. Do you want to know what's changed my life that you recommended that we do? Like it's I, if I could give a tip of something, I that, would I would say the tantric sex multi orgasmic breath work, but we were just talking about that. We haven't tried it we yet. Started, we're gonna so have to. Yeah, we're gonna get. We're gonna yeah. do that after I, this. Episode. Right before yeah, you're yeah. about to come, <laughs> I need you to do ta- a tantric you hear breath. Me breathing heavily. No, I want to talk about you that. You might want him to practice before sex. Great, you and Taylor sure can go practice. practice. If, you, if you hear a lot of loud <laughs> breaths coming out of my man cave, just don't don't just stay away for a little. The while. audience is like, "What are you guys talking about? We'll 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 get in." Is that what it sounds like? No. I don't know if I can handle Michael like really deep breathing when when we're having sex. Well, like, how deep on. are we talking? Is no, it like quick, <gasps> quick, quick, quick rabbit hole? All all all, all tantric breathwork is, and this would be very similar to what you'd find in like uh, pranayama breathwork or Tumi breathwork, or even like Wim Hof has some components of this. Is you're moving energy from your root chakra, where you're, where your genitalia and you down by your crotch, and you're breathing that up to your head, trapping it up in the crown chakra. All that energy. And then you can move it via the exhale back down to the root chakra. And as you practice doing this, like a deep breath in, and you kind of squeeze your perineum and all of your kind of like your your uh, your muscles all around your genitals, and then you you trap it up in the top of your head, and then you relax everything in the pelvic floor musculature, and you let that energy go back down to the pelvic floor musculature. And what you Can do you is, film is, a tutorial. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> send me a video oh, later. There probably are on YouTube if you YouTube tantric breath work. But what you do is right when you're about to come, you breathe. You just take one breath in, and you breathe all the energy up to your crown chakra, and you hold it there, right? And you can stop thrusting and kind of slow down a little bit just to make sure that, that you're not distracted as you're doing this. And then once that sensation, and and you'll have like a mini orgasm without an ejaculate when you do that. And then when when that kind of washes over you. Then you relax the pelvic floor musculature and breathe back down to the root chakra. And you can do that multiple times. You know, that, that there's a book called The Multi-Orgasmic Male. And in that book, he calls it the power draw, I think. You know, same type of technique. But you can practice this, you know, whatever. Like, like, for example, I like to kill two birds with one stone. I'm a, I'm a total multitasker. And there's this exercise I do in the gym called the hip bridge, right? Where you have your heels up and you're kind of thrusting with yeah. your heels up. It's a great butt exercise. And what I do is when I, when I thrust with my hips up, what I would do is breathe in, like trap all the energy up in my crown chakra. Well, at the same time, all my pelvic floor musculature is contracted anyways, cause I'm up in that hip bridging position. And then when you come back down out of the hip bridging position, you exhale, you relax everything. And so you can literally just like do a gym exercise and, and I need to do that exercise more. Anyway, that. So Taylor, Taylor's come on the podcast and talked about how he comes in one minute and he's had this big problem, mm-hmm. um, with coming. And we mentioned that he does edging, which is masturbating until you're mm-hmm. about to come and then stopping. Yeah. And you think that this is going to be more effective for Taylor to apply is to breathe into his crown so- chakra hold it, contract all his muscles, and then breathe out. I'm not saying he shouldn't edge because, you know, that that doing both might actually give him even even more time. But I think the tantric breath work is is super effective. And, um, you know, I I don't masturbate a lot anyways. And so I don't don't do a lot of edging. Do you not masturbate because you want to have sex more pleasurable? What's the reason that you don't? Yeah, I, I find that my orgasms with my wife are more pleasurable when I don't masturbate. You know, you kind of, you know, when you're, when you're like, it, most guys know, you know, like the best sex is when you're kind of blue balled and like, you're really, really ready for it. And so, you know, I'd rather go that way. 
Oh. Yeah. So, so I want to speak into the, the bedroom. That I, I mean, this is obviously. Wait, I have to tell him what the oh. main thing is. It's oh. about the bedroom. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. We got on a tangent. We went down the, to such a rabbit hole here. The um. By the way, all guys, the incandescent start, red start breathing mm-hmm. into your chakra before you're about to come. It'll yes. do all the girls that are listening a your favor. If, if you're in the bathroom and your husband or significant others in the background, turn that part up and just walk away and manipulate mm-hmm. him without manipulating him. There you go. Okay. Um. So one thing that you told me that has absolutely changed my life is putting red light bulbs in the bedroom. Oh yeah. It yeah. is. I have this whole wind down period now that I never had. I would just get in bed and yeah. think like, okay, it's time okay. to go to sleep. Old, old school red incandescent light bulbs. Yep. Yeah. Honestly, we they're hard to get now in California. They are kind of. Yeah. They are so it's amazing. Probably because of our podcast. Yeah. Honestly. <laughs> well, didn't they change some laws too? They they did shortly, and then so there was a while up until 2000. I think it was 2016 that incandescent light bulbs because they're a little bit of an energy hog yep. were kind of hard to get, and then I think Trump reversed that at some point because we know how much he loves the environment. Now you can get incandescent bulbs again. So what we did is we replaced all the lights in our ha- in our room with these red light bulbs. And mm-hmm. every single night we turn on those lights and our room is like a sex slave dungeon. Yeah. Yeah, it's like an Amsterdam nightclub. It's yeah. like an Amsterdam nightclub. Yeah. And um, Taylor's familiar with that. Um, and so we go in and we turn all the lights on with this red light and it cascades this light glow. But what, what the best part of it is, is I think it's helped my cortisol. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. that... Is that a benefit? Oh, absolutely. So when you wake up and sunlight hits your eyes in the morning, which it should, like it's a really good idea to try and get a lot of sunlight exposure in the morning. And actually, if you can't, you know, like the blue light blocking glasses and and the screen protecting software and all that, like rip all that away. Like you want to be staring at bright screens and blue light, break all the rules that you normally do at night. Like you break all those rules in the morning because all that light, especially that blue light and that greenish light, those are a couple of the spectrums that you get from full on sunlight or a screen in the morning, preferably sunlight again, because you get a lot of other stuff like infrared and, and near infrared. But you um, you get a release of cortisol when that happens, and that's your wakey wakey hormone. It makes you feel good and gives you energy in the morning. And this is also why if you have that cortisol surge in the morning, and you also do a cup of coffee, and you also do a CrossFit workout, and you're just like stimulating, stimulating, stimulating in the morning. Some people can get a little bit of an afternoon slump just because they get such a big cortisol surge in the morning. And your body has to use a lot of precursors for other hormones to make cortisol, you know, like uh, pregnenolone and um, you know some of your cholesterol, some of your vitamin D, your DHEA, etc. And so in the morning, you get this cortisol surge. But of course, if you stare at a bunch of bright lights at night, obviously, you're also getting a cortisol surge at night. So you also get the the melatonin suppressing effect of those bright lights. You'd, you'd want to avoid a lot of the brightness at night. So it is likely that you see a little bit of a suppression of cortisol when you're not blasting yourself with light in your bedroom at night. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I want to talk to you about hormones. I told you earlier that I went to get my hormones tested and they were all out of whack and my thyroid was low. Mm. Do you recommend balancing your hormones naturally or do you like? would you recommend someone go the medical route? There, there's an argument that could be made for both. I mean, it, it, there, there is something to be said for better living through science. For example, a ton of women, and, and surprisingly, um, uh, men who are who are kind of like ADD, ADHD ish. There's, there's even one doc, Michael Platt, who will prescribe it for for kids who have ADD uh, progesterone, like a five percent progesterone cream that you apply. For example, on the inner part of the arm where you don't have a lot of hair follicles, which can inhibit some of the absorption of the progesterone. That can be a, a wonderful way to get a pick me up in energy and libido, especially for a woman who has progesterone deficiency or who has what's called estrogen dominance, right? And and that would be a surplus of estrogen that's a lot of times brought on by both uh, um, perimenopause or menopause, but then also can be related to drinking lots of water from plastic bottles, getting exposed to a lot of xenoestrogens and personal care products and shampoos and household cleaning chemicals. And then you throw, you know, it, things like flax and edamame and, and some of these estrogen rich plant sources typically aren't problematic for most people. But if you're already estrogen dominant, like those can just dump more fuel on the fire. But progesterone can be really, really nice. And, and that would be something that might not be considered like a, you know, a, a natural route 
for for hormone management, but that can be very effective. A lot of women will respond really well to like a microdose of testosterone as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you apply just like a small, small dose of testosterone cream back to sex, prior to sex on the clitoris for women, like you, you can have amazing orgasms. That or uh, nitroglycerin cream is another one that works. Really oh, yeah. We well talked about that. that last time. Do we? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, the NOS cream. Taylor's but, Googling both yeah, for his girlfriend. Yeah. But um, for, for the hormones, A, you need to test. And you need to test frequently if you are using any type of replacement therapy, like say progesterone, or if you're meaning on- like you don't just get one test, do it, and then stay with that. Like you got to go back after and see what the right. You want to monitor your levels so the hormones that you're taking aren't say being over aromatized to produce excess amounts of estrogen. Uh, in males, sometimes who are taking testosterone, you see an impact on things like hematocrit and red blood cells that that could cause those to become too high. Occasionally, you'll see an increase in in prostate specific antigen. Sometimes you'll see uh, increase in estrogen again in men or an over conversion of the testosterone to something called DHT, which can cause things like hair loss or acne. So you do want to test frequently. How if, frequently if you is are frequently? On hormones. I would say a quarterly basis is pretty good. And there are, there are different ways to test hormones, but I think the best way is urine because a urine measurement, there's a great test called a Dutch test, a dried urine test yep. for hormones. And that one does a really good job at identifying not just your hormone levels as they fluctuate throughout the day, because you got to pee on a little stick like five times during the day to do the test. So you're not just, you know, some people get a blood test for say cortisol and it'll be, let, let's say kind of low. But then if you look at it throughout the rest of the day, after that one single snapshot from the blood, it's actually pretty normal. And so the Dutch test allows you to see how the hormones are fluctuating throughout the day rather than getting you a one-time snapshot. And they also show you some of what are called the metabolites of the hormones, which is interesting. So you talked about something like thyroid, Lauren. Well, what you can see is if you're low thyroid, sometimes you don't break down cortisol that well, right? And so you might see someone who has rampantly high levels of cortisol get a test, but if you do the the dried urine test, you may see that what's actually occurring is that cortisol metabolites are low because the cortisol isn't getting broken down properly. So it's not an issue, say, of, let's say, like you being way too stressed out, you having too much coffee in the morning, you can dig a little deeper if you see a high amount of cortisol metabolites or a low amount of cortisol metabolites, and it might be an indication that your thyroid is not functioning properly, right? And so the Dutch test can give you a lot of clues. And if you work with a good functional medicine doc who can look at the results and analyze them for you and then make little tweaks as you go, that can pair really well with some type of hormone replacement therapy. What, what's If someone has low thyroid like I was diagnosed with and then they get that thyroid balanced, what are, like, what are the differences of how I'm going to feel? Well, first, I mean, if you test low thyroid, you don't want to just have a doctor look at, say, what, what, what a lot of doctors will look at is, is TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. If thyroid stimulating hormone is high, some docs will, will say if it's above four, I think, I think above two is an even better measurement of whether or not it's, it's excessively high. That is an indication that your brain is trying to get your thyroid to produce more, more thyroid hormone because it's not or because the thyroid hormone isn't getting converted properly into its active form into into what's called t3 and the problem is if you're just getting tsh it doesn't really tell you why you're you're you don't have enough thyroid hormone right like it could be that you uh that you test and your tsh is high but then if you do a more advanced thyroid panel that's looking at t3 t4 free t3 free t4 thyroid antibodies and reverse T3, all of a sudden you have all the clues that you need. Like let's say that you've got high TSH and poor thyroid function, but your thyroid antibodies test high. Well, that's indicative that there's some sort of immune system reaction that's suppressing thyroid function. And in many cases, those are things like wheat, soy, dairy, you know, problematic allergenic foods or foods that people are often intolerant to. And so the approach there would be to use a more, more of kind of like an autoimmune approach to adjusting thyroid. Sometimes you'll see that thyroid antibodies are just fine. Uh, and this is something you'll see a lot of times in like the ketogenic community, especially like the ketogenic active athlete community. They're not getting enough glucose to support the conversion of inactive thyroid hormone, T4, into T3. And so with somebody like that, you might say, okay, we just got to you know, eat a little bit more carbohydrate at night. Maybe don't train quite as hard if you are going to do a, a low carb diet. And so... You know, you always have to step back and look at why thyroid is low. 
uh, but uh, in in the in the case of something like a Dutch test, it doesn't measure thyroid, so you'd have to do you know just a basic you know thyroid panel from you, you, and you can order those from Direct Labs, from Wellness FX, from a lot of these services that will just you know allow you to print off a lab form and bring it to a, a lab core or quest and, and have the test run. I want to come back to this stuff. I want to get back to inflammation and glycemic index and, and also thyroid because it's in the next uh, set of to- topics that I have. But I want to address one thing first, and that's sleep. We started to kind of touch on it because I feel like if you solve a lot of the issues that you're having with sleep, there's so many people that are stressed right now and like you know anxious and maybe they're not getting the best sleep of their life. And I feel like if you can solve at least, if you can get some better sleep, a lot of these issues can be somewhat oh, yeah. easier to tackle. We did, Lauren and I both did that chronobiotic biology test to see what you know and we can talk about yeah. that you had like what Whether is it you're a dolphin dolphin or a lion or a bear or a wolf yeah, yeah. and i want to talk about it. we've never talked about it on yeah. the show before we're both bears mm-hmm. which i feel is a good thing but and when mm-hmm. i figured that out we've changed the way that we like our sleep cycles when we eat when we drink coffee when we eat and all that all mm-hmm. that stuff and i feel like it's helping a lot because i was right. one of those guys before i'm like hey i'm just gonna have a lot of discipline here. I'm gonna to try to get up at 5 a.m. and then I'm gonna go through the whole thing. When I realize right. like maybe that's too early for me. So you're a bear, like more of a 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. kind of guy trying to adhere to a lion. Yes. You know, more like an 8 or 9 p.m. to a 4 or 5 a.m. Yes. Type of sleep schedule. And by the way, that is that is that that whole uh, patterning of sleep chronobiology is not from me. That's from Dr. Michael Bruce. He's actually local. He's he's in L.A. I want to have him and, on here. Um, yeah, and and he he gave me permission to actually talk about some of that stuff in my book. But he he's the guy who originated that idea, Dr. Michael. We Bruce. signed up for his newsletter. I yeah. was going to mention him too, but yeah. But I want to talk. I, and if you have permission, I want to talk about the chronobiology because I think a lot of people don't know. I mean, right? Mm-hmm. You just hear like night owl or morning, whatever the hell mm-hmm. they call it in the morning. And I was one of those people that was like, okay, well, like you know, it's good to get up super early, so I'm going to get up at five mm-hmm. and work. And what I realized, I'm actually way more effective if I get up at like six, go to bed at like ten thirty, eleven. Um, but before I was trying to do that different, so like maybe we can dive into this a little bit before we get back to the other stuff. Yeah, certainly. So the, there, it is true that certain people do better on certain sleep cycles. Like we, we mentioned like, you know, the bear is a 10 to six, the lion is a little bit earlier to bed, earlier to wake. The dolphin is kind of, uh, all over the map. And one of those people who often struggles with insomnia and, and really weird fluctuating sleep cycles. And then the wolf is that person who does really well at whatever, staying up till 2 a.m., tapping away on the keyboard of the computer and then, you know, sleep till 10 a.m. and they're wired up that way. Now, what's interesting is that exposure to light, which we briefly touched on because of its ability to be able to cause that cortisol surge, allows you to kind of make slight tweaks to your chronobiology. So you can use light to shift your circadian rhythm forwards or backwards and what I mean by that is if I have been back east for like a week and then I come back over to the Pacific coast where I live and, you know, I'm up in Washington state. So I'm Pacific time zone and I'm waking up at, let's say 3:30 AM, right? Because that was 6:30 AM for me back East where I was waking up. That's a problem for me. Cause I don't want to get up at 3:30 AM because life is going to be kind of crappy by the time 1 PM rolls around. So what you do is you keep everything dark. And when you get up, you put on blue light blocking glasses if you do get out of bed and you don't look at screens or if you do look at them, you have a good light protection software installed on your computer. I think one of the better ones out there is called uh, Iris. And you don't get out and go watch the sunrise at 5.30 a.m. You essentially try to treat your house or your bedroom like a cave until the time arrives when you actually do want your body to start waking up. And then you open all the curtains and you take off your blue light blocking glasses and you, you know, turn off the screen protection software and just blast yourself with light. And within about two or three days of doing that, you can shift your circadian rhythm really quickly back into the time zone that you want it to be in. And, and so light can be used, you know, same thing if you're back on the, uh, um, on the East Coast and you want to be able to stay up later, right? You could, for example, get good light exposure at 7 or 8 p.m. and thus push your circadian rhythm forward. Right. So so it kind of depends where you're at in the world and what you want to do with light. But the chronobiology is something that's a natural tendency. But what I'm getting at is it's not totally fixed, which is important because if you are, say, wired up to be a wolf and you have a job that you're supposed to be at 8 a.m., it's not like you're going to change your whole life to go to bed at 2 a.m. and get up at 10 a.m. So you're going to go to bed at 10 p.m. You're going to limit all your light exposure at night and then you're going to blast yourself with light in the morning when you get up and you're going to be okay. You're going to function in society, even though you might be wired up to be a little bit more of a night owl. 
what was helpful to me is just framing out that like, oh, there's not just one way or another. It's not just like you're a morning or night person. It's like there's little shifts that 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 happen within their night. For me, I was like, I have to be up at five because I like to be up super early and ahead of the day. But I realized I wasn't as effective as if I get up at six. If I get up at six and maybe work an hour longer than I would have if I got up at five, I'm actually way more effective. I switch my workout to the afternoon as opposed to the super early morning, like I actually sleep better. And I think that's right. what's interesting to go into. So I, I suggest people check it out. It's um, Dr. Yeah. Michael Br- how do you yeah, Dr. Michael Bruce. And like, I'm a bear and, and technically I feel better if I sleep in to like six or six 30 AM, but I also get a shit ton done. If I get up at like five, when my kids aren't up and my wife's not yeah. up and the house is quiet and I can do a little bit of meditation and some stretching and some breath work and I can drink the coffee before my wife gets to it and drinks the whole pot. And then I have to make another pot. You know, I can do all my, all my nice little body care stuff when I get up early in the morning and I can write and I can read. But of course, the problem is that I'm, you know, technically in, in an ideal scenario, I'm a little bit more wired up to get it at 630. So for me, like the perfect scenario is I go to bed around 10 8 or 10 p.m. I get up around 5, 530 a.m. And then I just do a quick afternoon power nap for about 20 minutes. And I have this whole elaborate napping routine where I, you what, know, I get, what is it? Tell I get us. out a little bit of lavender oil <laughs> to relax, you know, put a little bit of that on my upper lip to relax me is like aromatherapy. I experimented with a bunch of relaxing compounds right? like CBD and valerian chamomile and everything kind of makes you kind of groggy when you get up from your afternoon nap, except the one thing I find that allows me to relax and get into a good, nice afternoon power nap without making me feel groggy afterwards is reishi, reishi mushroom extract. So I'll usually use a couple packs of that four sigmatic reishi and sometimes I'll put it in hot water. Or sometimes I'll just dump it straight into my mouth. And I find that kind of shifts me. Before into, or after you? Be, before. Before. Before, yeah. And then uh, I I will usually play like something really relaxing with some noise blocking headphones and a really good sleep mask. So I treat my power naps almost like miniature plant medicine journeys, right? You just go full on sensory depth. You know, the noise blocking headphones, a really good sleep mask, like um, Mindfold makes a really good one. I recently discovered another sleep mask called the um, silent mode mask, which is like a cocoon that wraps around your whole head (laughs) and has little speakers built into it. And it just, it feels like you're super protected. That's another thing he's going to buy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jesus Christ. Hang that up by the ozone (laughs) generator. Oh my God. And um, and, and so I'll play something really relaxing. Like uh, uh, there's an app called Brain FM that does some really relaxing power nap tracks. There's another app I like called Sleep Stream that plays like some ambient noise that helps you to fall asleep. My favorite is one called New Calm, uh, N-U Calm. And I didn't believe these guys when I when I interviewed them on my podcast. They said their 20-minute power nap cycle that they have built into this nap can, or in the, into the app, can simulate a 90-minute sleep cycle and just put you dead to the world within a couple of minutes. And I started using it. And I, could, I, I will drop down for 20 minutes when I put this thing on. And I'll wake up with like drool coming out of my mouth from whatever I had for lunch, you know, like some green avocado and sardine and olive oil drool and and feel like I've completely pushed the reboot button. I'm good to go the rest of the day. And that that one is amazing. But that's that's how I do my power nap. And then typically, and of course, this is the one problem with an afternoon nap is you are you, you can still feel like you need a little kick in the butt to get going and get motivated to jump back into your work day. So I will either have like just like a, a, a good strong shot of espresso or cup of coffee or because I, I work at home a lot and I'm taking this nap at home next to my home office, right outside my front door, I have this cold tub that I keep at about 33 degrees. And it's annoying to have to take all my clothes off and jump in the cold tub. What I do is I just take my shirt off. I just plunge my whole upper body into that cold tub and kind of you know splash my head around a little bit stand up and man like if, if you're able to just like throw your body in the cold water after that afternoon nap you feel like a beast the rest of the day what's the brand of the cold plunge pool you have and what's I, the brand of the sauna you have uh the the cold pool is called a Morozco. it just came out last year and it's really cool it's like this slick sexy stainless steel tub but it's in this really cool designer wooden box and they built in ozone and UV to clean. So you don't have to put chlorine right, you in have to it. do all the shit. It stays yeah. clean. And it'll maintain like 32 degrees Fahrenheit when it's 110 degrees outside. There's still little chunks of, how, how big of is ice it? floating in it. It's the size of, um, uh, like, have you ever seen people doing like cold thermogenesis on Instagram or whatever? Yeah. And then they're the big stainless steel tubs. 
It's like the size of that, like a one person stainless steel okay. tub, but it just freaking works. Like it's, it's amazing. And then the sauna that I use is called a, a clear light. Then I have the big one. It's called the sanctuary, which I love because when I have dinner parties at my house, the way it works is we don't sit around the living room for an hour, you know, drinking wine and, and chatting and having cocktails before dinner. I, I gather everybody, I say, yeah, yeah come, come over to our house. We're going to have a big barbecue on Friday night. Bring your swimsuit, right? Change your clothes. And I give everybody a towel and I turn on the sauna like a half hour before everybody's going to show up. And we go down to the sauna and we sit in the sauna and we play music and we sweat. And sometimes, you know, we'll bring some essential oils in there or burn some Palo Santo or, or I'll bring like, you know, a, a, a vaporizer in there and vape a little bit of, you know, tobacco or essential oils or weed or whatever. And then we all, after we've got a good sweat on for 20 or 30 minutes, you know, we, we're just sitting around the sauna because it can fit six people in it chatting. We all traipse outside and go jump in the cold pool or jump in the cold tub. And then everybody comes in for dinner. And it's amazing because, A, you, you're kind of hungry and, like, you're ready to go punish <laughs> these amazing organic meals that we make at our house. But then, B, if you do heat and cold like that at night, you sleep like a freaking baby. And it's, it's just a, an amazing feeling. It's so funny because I have, ever since I got pregnant, I've had this, like, really, really gnarly need for nature. Like I just, I, LA is starting to feel, and I don't know if it's the quarantine mixed in with it, it's starting to feel like it's closing in on me. And I just told Michael, I think I only have four years here. Like I, I for me to live here the rest of my life and commit to that, I, I, I don't want it. I want space. I want mm-hmm. to have the sauna and all the things. That's like, what's, that's, what's my goal in life. It's not really material. It's more like having this sort of setup that you have with the grounding and and the sauna and um and the what's it called the um the the water thing that you the ice plunge pool. Oh, the Morales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That to me is like yeah. goals. And don't get me wrong, you get, you could have like a quarter acre of of land in a backyard and have all that stuff, but. I do agree. There, there's something about nature, and I was blessed. And I realize I sound like a like a rich effing asshole, you know, saying this on the podcast. But I've got ten acres of property up in Washington on the Washington Idaho border where I built our house, and it's just like this private oasis. And we got goats and chickens and a vegetable garden, and you know, and and me and my twin twelve year old boys, we all have bows, so we can go out hunting for deer or turkey or you know or meat if we need to put some meat in the freezer and we've got all these wild plants like wild nettle and wild mint so you know if if i want to make a meal and i'm stuck at home we don't want to go out to the grocery store because it's annoying to do the mask and go stand in line and blah 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 um you know i can go out in the forest and i can gather some wild nettle and some wild mint and maybe a little bit of plantain leaf and then traipse up through the garden and collect a little bit of rosemary and thyme and i'll put all that in a food processor and throw some walnuts or some pine nuts in there a bunch of olive oil, some sea salt, shave off a little bit of lemon rind, and then just press go on the food processor. And I have this wonderful wild plant pesto that, you know, you can put on crackers I mean, or on steak. who fucking and, cares about a handbag or cars or right. shoes? No, this, I, I want to make my fucking yeah. like wild yeah. like yeah, I mean, pesto only, sauce. We moved up here, obviously, because we had to I set up this business. Mm-hmm. But like it was never, I mean, L.A., I say, is like a pit stop in, yeah. in where we'll... In our right, journey. In our journey, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, granted, like I... So I bought that land seven years ago. I used to hunt on that land and I made an offer to the landowner for $90,000 and, you know, got the land, spent a couple of years saving up so I could make a down payment to have a, a, a doable mortgage to be able to build a home there. Then we built a home and then we, we eventually built like a little pool house and we built the goat and chick, you know, and over How the How long did this take? We've been years, adding to this. We, yeah. we, we've been adding like over the past four years. We just built a little guest house. You know, my kids built this tree fort. It's like their own little Airbnb. You know, it was part of their education. Their mathematics curriculum last year was building a tree fort, you know, figuring out geometry and angles and calculating square footage of materials. I, I love to, to do things like that in their education, you know, life-based experiential based education but we've just kind of built things up as as we go and i mean you know so i paid that much for the land and then all said and done by the time you take what i saved up and put down for a down payment i'm paying like two thousand bucks a month for a mortgage and you know so it's it's, you're not going to get 10 acres in la for 90k no 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 but if you if you move up to idaho or washington or one of these places like washington no taxes either it's not that expensive here's my question because we would have to come to la like you come to Mm -hmm. la yeah. Do you just do like a week every three months? How do you sort mm-hmm. of structure it? Yeah, I batch it. 
about you. So, so what do you do? When I go to LA, mostly LA and New York, you know, somebody's like, oh, we want to have you on the podcast. Well, I just, I, I kind of save up all the, all the requests or all the meetings I want to have. And then I'll just pick a free five or seven days. I'll hop on, you know, a plane, fly down here, you know, stay in a hotel or an Airbnb or at a friend's house or whatever, you know, go all around town and then fly home. And, and so I, yeah, I batch it. It's yeah, smart. I like that too. Yep. I mean, I'm telling you this. And listen, there's a lot of people that listen is going to be in LA and be like, "Oh, LA's the best." But like, you know, I we grew up in San Diego, and LA's LA's okay. It's no, really hold. I, if someone thinks LA's the best, then that's fine. They can think it's the best. But for me, in my life, I my goal is to have space and nature and my whole thing yeah, set up. That's all she asks for. Michael. Yeah, Just that's space, it. nature, maybe there's, a pri- maybe private jet. <laughs> there's there's not a, that's not, yeah, a helicopter pad. I actually don't need the private jet. That's all she asks for on page one of the ass. And only three there. walk-in closets for the shoes. I don't need that's that. that. I don't need walk-in closets. No, I don't have that many shoes. That I'm low maintenance. Yeah. You know what's cool about, I mean, actually about my wife, like she's just not, she's never been into that stuff, which is like obviously saved me oh. a shitload of money because she doesn't have to, she doesn't care so much about that. It's great. You're not materialistic. Yeah, my, well, I mean, uh, that's just not what gets me off is material yeah, things. That's yeah. not what that's. I mean, she appreciates nice things, yeah. but she's not like she's not like heading to yeah. get a new handbag every month. Yeah. Just not I like thing. a good lunch. Yeah, <laughs> I, I hear. You. Well, my my wife, she she likes nice things, but she likes to make them herself, right? So she she's she comes from a rancher girl background. So you know, you make the cinnamon rolls from scratch. You know, you ferment the sourdough. You know, everything in the kitchen is made from scratch. So you go to our house. There's there's not a lot of boxed, processed, packaged foods because just you know everything the the flour and the bran and the germ and the legumes everything just in glass mason jars or fermenting in the refrigerator so it's all from scratch and then you know that she'll find some some chair at the at the vintage store you know for you know one tenth of the cost and she'll bring it home and upholster it and make a chair and so she's very into to taking things and reinventing them so the home has good feng shui but it's there's not a lot of expensive stuff it's more like handmade stuff that's so cool though yeah. how do you guys work on your relationship like what are what are your tips for being in a strong relationship with a good foundation i love that question um so first of all we have this kind of rule in our house that love covers all like there's just this out for any argument that we have where you can just look your lover in the eye and say, I love you. This isn't worth it. Um, whatever. You drank all the coffee back to that again. And it's not worth us ruining our day over. Give me a hug. Let's put this all behind us. And we just have that, that simple understanding. And then the other understanding that we have in our house, not only with my wife and I, but with the boys, is we have no judgment zone talks where you can, you can just come up to your spouse, to your kid and say, I need to tell you something. I need to get something off my chest. Can I have one of the no judgment zone talks with you? And it's your space to go and tell that person maybe something that's really annoying you about them, something they did that hurt you. And the understanding is that the person who is receiving that no judgment zone talk, they're only, they're not supposed to argue. They're not supposed to say why they did something. All they need to say is just, okay, thank you. And, and that's it. Like they don't, they don't even need to apologize. Let's, let's adapt that. Those, those a, are two really good. Honestly, yeah, those are two really good chance. rules. And then there, there's, there's, full on transparency. So um, what I mean by that is, is anything, anything is just completely on the table in a relationship, full transparency without judgment. And um, what really got us kind of started down that route, because we do a lot of, a lot of eye gazing. We pray a lot together in bed before we go to sleep at night. We have this shared Google doc, my wife and I do, where whenever somebody tells us, you know, I'm going through this hard time, please pray for me, or, you know, I'm going to have a baby or, you know, or, you know, I'm sick or I'm struggling financially. You know, can you pray for me? My wife and I just keep this big Google doc and we, we pray together at night for like 10 or 15 minutes before we go to bed and somehow coming together, like as a team, as a unit and praying for other people, it's been, it sounds kind of gimmicky, but it's actually been really really nice for a relationship to finish the day and have that end cap on the day. Now, speaking of end caps on the day, in the morning, everybody's running around. There's not a lot of time, but we take 10 minutes as a family. And this is typically right after or right before breakfast. And we go out on the porch if it's the summertime, or we gather around the fireplace in the living room if it's the wintertime. And we all meditate for five minutes. We sit on the floor, cross-legged, uh, sometimes we'll listen to a meditation app like the one that we're using right now is called abide. And it's a, this kind of breath work, positive message, devotional kind of app. And we sit around and we listen to the meditation and we breathe. 
And then after the meditation, we all have a journal and we do two things in the morning. We write down one thing that we're grateful for that day. And then we write down one person who we can pray for or serve that day. So we start the day with meditation, with gratitude, and with service. And that might sound like super exhausting, but that takes like 10 or 15 minutes for us to gather as a family and do that. And it's just a non-negotiable and we all hold each other accountable, which is nice. And we even have this app called Habitory, which is an app that allows you to make a checklist for different people who are a part of a group and have different things listed on that checklist, like journaling or meditation or breath work. And all of us, you know, the kids on their little MacBooks, me on, on my MacBook, mom on her computer, no matter where we're at, I'm traveling, I'm in LA, you know, Jess is off on the coast or whatever. We all go into that app and we check box each day that, that we've done it. So we all hold each other accountable. And then at the end of the day, we have these glorious family dinners. Everybody pitches in and we all cook together. We break all the rules about circadian rhythmicity and eating late at night. I understand that sometimes sleep cycles are improved by not having a heavy meal within three hours prior to bed. But for us, the pros of this big, glorious family dinner each night, when everybody's kind of done and you're not thinking, oh, we still got to take the kids to jujitsu after Two or dinner. three kids you have. With two, two, twin boys, yeah. And so we gather for these family dinners and we we laugh, we joke, we play games like Scrabble or Quiddler or Boggle or Scattergories or, you know, Canasta, Hearts, you name it. And we just, we have these wonderful dinners and then we all help to clean up together. We go upstairs to the boys' bedroom and usually I'll play them a little bit of music, play them some bedtime songs. And then we finish the day. The end cap of the day is we take out our journals again and we do what's called self-examination and purpose. So what I mean by that is for self-examination, we all write down the answer to what good have I done this day and what could I have done better today? So how did you rise to the occasion? How did you help someone out? You know, what, what did you do that day that feels really satisfying or fulfilling or, or that really helped you to, to love God or love other people or love the planet? You know, what, what did you do that day that was good? And then also, where did you fail? What could you have done better that, that you could learn more about? Like for me, um, last night, I, I, what I wrote in my journal for the, what I could have done better was I could have done more breath work when I was driving. I was driving to Nobu. I was stuck in traffic. It took me an hour to drive freaking five miles from Malibu out to Nobu. I was supposed to meet my friends there. I got to dinner. Dinner was not fun for me because I was all stressed out from the drive. And it was because, you know, I was, I was driving. I was breathing. I was looking at my watch, looking at, at Google Maps, trying to find a different direction. Whereas I guarantee if I just would have done, you know, like I tell other people, some de-stress breath work, listen to some uplifting audio or some nice music and just use that as a chance for moving meditation for a little while, dinner would have been a lot more pleasant for me. And so when I write down that thing I could have done better, uh, you know, if I have a dinner tonight and I'm stuck in traffic, I guarantee because I wrote that down in my journal, I'm going to be a little bit more mindful about not allowing something I'm doing before dinner to stress me out. So we do what good have I done this day? What could I have done better today? And then finally, what is one way that I lived out my purpose statement in life? Because we all have this one single succinct purpose statement that defines why we get out of bed in the morning. You know, what's our unique skill set that we can bring forth into the world to affect other people with, to love other people, to make this world a better place? Like mine is to read, write, learn, teach, sing, speak, compete, and create in full presence and selfless love to the glory of God. Right? That's my purpose statement. And so every day in the journal, I'll write down what's one way that I lived out that purpose statement. And we do that with our kids and, and my wife and I, even if the kids are gone, my wife and I do it together at the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Okay, so we've got transparency. We've got no judgment zones. We have the love covers all rule. We have our, our morning and our evening routines that we all do together as a family. And then the last thing I don't think is necessary for everyone. And probably, you know, some people are called to this, some are not. But every quarter, my wife and I do a plant medicine journey together where we have a facilitator who administers some certain medicines from the Amazon that allow us to just drop back into bliss and ego dissolution and kind of journeying in a space where we're not self-analyzing and 
you know, the left and right hemispheres are working together. And, is, it, is it psilocybin or is it, what is it? Uh, the facilitator we work with, he's got access to like 60 different Amazonian med. He's like okay. the Dr. Strange of plant medicine. And I discovered him through another couple that was using him successfully. for. And this is all he does is work with couples. Up in Washington? Uh, Can you share uh, his name he, or is it is I, it private? I, well, be, because it's technically illegal to oh, do in the U.S. Okay. I can't share his name, but um, he, he, uh, he, he lives down south and we actually... To, a couple of times we've flown him up to our house, but we usually travel down south, you know, on a quarterly retreat to go see him. We tack on two extra days to to journal, to walk together, to integrate. Typically what comes out of those sessions is that we've got more insight into things we want to start doing more together as a family or ways in which we're raising our boys that we feel we could do a better job at or things that have come between us that we want to talk about. And then this is the really powerful part of that is after we've kind of done our own journeys in separate rooms, um, he brings us together and we sit in these chairs called backjack chairs in bed, facing each other, legs intertwined, and it's like truth serum. And we're staring deep into each other's eyes. He administers more medicine to us. And then we're literally journeying together, looking straight into each other's eyes, just talking for hours and hours and hours. And we have a digital recorder set up that records the whole thing. And then afterwards, we, we listen to it. We write down all the little takeaways. You know, um, it can be everything. I mean, it, like the sky's, sky's the limit for the kind of stuff that we talk about. It can be, do you, do you feel like, you know, that, that the boys are having a good childhood and, and what, what could we change with what they're doing? Or, you know, Taryn seems unhappy right now with life. Let's talk about, you know, how we can support him better as, as he enters into adolescence. And sometimes it's something like, do you want to fuck me in the ass? Right. Like, like <laughs> it, it, it's literally anything goes when we're having these conversations. And so we're sitting facing each other. We do that once a quarter. We've been doing that for two years and that has been transformative for our relationship in terms of, we literally feel like we're spiritually intertwined and you, and the first few times we did it, we're like, yeah, that was just like drugs. That just, you know, we were on medicine, you know, and, and we say all these things, but then we realized like everything we were talking about, everything we were integrating, everything we were implementing, when we get back, it was sticking. Like, you know, we weren't arguing anymore and we were super transparent even when we weren't on medicine because we'd learned how to be in that space, you know, in that kind of truth serum space. And, um, yeah. And, and again, like that's kind of fringe. I don't think every well, no, couple I want to stay on this to go for a second. off and do drugs, but, but well, that's, that's been a real game changer. Lauren and I have had some of the better conversations, I think for our relationship on psilocybin when we, you know, like I think we always say like it gets rid of the ego so you can actually listen and hear what the other person's saying in conversation. And like you said, it sticks, but there's something you, you posted the other day that I thought was really smart. I actually shared it with Lauren. I think we're getting to a place where more and more people are talking about psilocybin and plant medicine. And it's also in, in, in some ways it's kind of becoming recreational or people feel like it is like maybe there's a path to legality for a lot of this stuff and so right. I, we see a lot of people that are maybe overdoing it or abusing it and i think like personally in my life i've known some people that you, they start taking it and all of a sudden you're like what's your, your brain's getting a little out of whack here buddy and like they start to get like a little bit too yeah. far where the intention of this stuff at least for for me is to have those breakthroughs have those conversations to go a little deep within yourself and figure something out whether it's a, a problem you need to work through in your brain or, or something but i think what i want i when you posted about it i was i shared it with some people because i was like listen maybe we're getting to a place where people are feeling a little too comfortable with this stuff and they're using it as like a night out on the town or to go party and they're yep. doing it frequently, but this is powerful stuff. And so from your perspective, I wanted you to like elaborate a little bit more on what you yeah. shared. Um, I don't remember what I shared, but I, but I, I have it had three... to do with serotonin levels and dipping okay, and frying yeah. the brain a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've got three thoughts on that. First, you are correct because plant medicine is considered now in many situations to be noble or laudable, you know, finding my true self and dissolving PTSD, my ego. PTSD, all such stuff. Yeah. Know, but people are now using that to use psilocybin and MDMA every single weekend and have that as an excuse when really I've often found that for many people it's an escape. Right, you're you're you got your headphones on and your your mask and you you say that oh I'm I'm journeying and finding and you're pretty much just like tripping balls as an escape from life right and I I find that some people will use it as an out because now it's considered to be acceptable and you need to be careful you need to check yourself you need to read a book like Anthony DeMello's book Awareness and understand that if there's anything in your life that you can't look at and say you are a pleasure I derive pleasure from you 
but I do not depend upon you for my happiness, right? I, I am not attached to you. You're a pleasure in life that I could do with or without. If you can't say that to anything, you know, whatever, cannabis or or steak or, you know, uh, um, porn, you know, alcohol, Net- Netflix, anything, yeah, yeah. porn, alcohol, you name it, then you probably need to step back from that object or that thing and detach yourself from it. So that, that that's one is be careful that you're not using something that because society now considers it to be noble or laudable as like an escape or just a way to trip and get away from life for a little while. Um, the, the next thing is that um, I think that any shortcut, any hack does not build the same type of character, control, uh, development, and all the aspects related to the fact that often the the destination is not as meaningful as the journey. And what I'm getting at is that I think anyone who begins to partake in plant medicine or wants to go off on an ayahuasca retreat or, 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 or take a heroic dose of psilocybin or whatever the case may be, you need to first like go on a camping trip where you're fasting with your journal, detached in your own space, lonely to a certain extent, dissolve your ego in that setting, do the hard work first, like learn how to fast how to meditate, how to journal, how to be off in nature without medicines, because often you may find the same type of breakthroughs you were looking for drugs to get you, you can find by actually doing the stoic hard work. And I think that if you've done that type of hard work, if you do decide after that, that you're still called to medicine, then the character development that you'll get from the medicine is going to be far more meaningful because you actually put in the hard work first. It's it's the same mentality that would want to get a gastric bypass versus going on a diet or beginning to eat more more healthy or more mindfully, right? You the shortcuts usually don't result in the same type of personal development or character development as as the fast track. So that's another thing is don't don't use medicines as a fast track. And then finally what you were alluding to, Michael, is the fact that I view the use of these type of substances, you know, not not micro, you know, microdosing with psilocybin or LSD or something like that. That can be some, something that's, that's somewhat safe to do on a regular basis. You yeah. know, small dose is very similar to a nootropic a little or, bit more or a smart drug. Yep. Um, safer than, than, you know, high amounts of coffee in, in some instances. But the problem is that the larger doses, I equivalent much of what happens in terms of neurotransmitter depletion and neural inflammation to getting a TBI or a concussion. Right, in, in terms of what actually happens on a neural level. So you need a great deal of support going into and coming out of these type of things. You need to make sure that, for example, going in, I'll use things like vitamin C and NAD and glutathione or N-acetylcysteine or any of these things that would be considered to be neural anti-inflammatories. And then afterwards, I'll replenish serotonin levels by using uh, 5-HTP. I'll replenish methyl groups by taking a, a liver capsules or... or uh, trimethylglycine or s methionine or any of these things that help to restore methyl groups. I think you're referring to an Instagram post that I did recently saying, well, here's, if you are going to do a plant medicine journey, here's what to use going in to protect your brain. And then here's what to use going after to restore neurotransmitters, to shut down inflammation, et cetera. I mean, you can, you can even, you look at a lot of the, of the, the practices used to heal someone of TBI or concussion. It's like, hyperbaric oxygen chambers and ketones and high dose fish oil, you know, and if you have access to those type of things, that'll help you bounce back even more. And so I, I do take this kind of stuff pretty seriously. Even well, I thought it was an important post yeah. because I think there's people that just don't know about this information and they're just like, Oh, I'm just going right. to take this. And they, and they start taking it really frequently and right. they're not doing any things to balance anything. And all of a sudden, like you look at, we've all know these people, they may be going too far on these trips and all of a sudden like meet them a year later and they're just like whacked out of their skull. Oh, oh yeah. You, you can create lasting damage. And most of the time it's related to inflammation inflammation or neurotransmitter depletion. I will say that I had such bad postpartum anxiety. It was horrible. And and this is I'm not a doctor, but what got me over it was microdosing. Like mm-hmm. I I don't I don't don't know if that what the science behind it is, but to go into you know doing psilocybin in nature mm-hmm. and having an intention going into it, which was that I needed to figure out why I was having this anxiety coming out of it the next day i felt exponentially better uh, i did it three times and I, I i feel like it's gone the postpartum anxiety yeah. Yeah, it's very it's very common for people to feel more stable when they engage in a microdosing protocol like for example for 10 weeks every three days use a 
very, very small dose of psilocybin. For some people, that might be 0.1 grams. Others who have higher tolerance, it might be 0.5 grams. And typically, you'll combine it with something like niacin or some other blood flow type of precursor and then uh, lion's mane. That, that's a common stack for a microdosing protocol. And you do that every three days for 10 weeks. And when you dose, you go for a long hike or a walk in the sunshine. You don't just use it as a way to get through emails faster. And many people feel that they, they, they get a great deal of personal development from doing that and a little bit more of a, of a, of a better connection to their true authentic self. You also get a little bit of a shift towards the right hemisphere of the brain in terms of, of accessing more creative kind of um, uh, less less OCD type of left hemispheric thinking that can just in and of itself decrease a little bit of stress because you're a little bit more freewheeling and a little bit less stuck in your habits and your rituals and your routines. So that's not uncommon for it to be somewhat anxiety relieving. What about alcohol? I noticed I was telling Michael the other day that that I used to be able to like th- like drink normal not a normal, yeah. but like I used to be able to have a couple glasses of wine and not feel really anything the next day. And now that I'm postpartum, I'm so sensitive. Like, yeah. I can't believe it. I had two margaritas the other day and I, like I feel like drunk. Yeah. Is yeah. that normal? Well, I think anybody who has used alcohol stopped and started drinking again knows that you're more sensitive to to ethanol just because you don't process it quite as well. I mean, there are certain enzymes that some people are deficient in like uh uh, some of the alcohol, I believe it's called the dehydrogenase enzyme, you know, that you'll see some Asians, for example, can't handle as much alcohol because they just don't break down the ethanol quite as well. And more of the ethanol gets converted into kind of a toxic molecule that gives you that hangover-ish effect called acetaldehyde, right? And so when you stop drinking and you downregulate a lot of those enzymes because you haven't been drinking in the same way as you would get um, you know, uh, uh, increase sensitivity to caffeine when you stop drinking coffee for a while. The same thing can happen with alcohol. So absolutely. My, my protocol with alcohol, and this is actually something really interesting, you know, back to writing my book and seeing some of these blue zones and how they live. Many of them, uh, they, they have women about one to two drinks of a really good organic wine or some bitters and digestifs mixed with, you know, a little vodka or gin or a clean burning alcohol. Uh, and that's, that's every single day. And in men, sometimes you'll see two to three drinks a day and there's kind of this, uh, protective effect, you know, probably based on the concept of a, there's a lot of antioxidants and flavanols and polyphenols and some nutritious compounds that you would find in, in, uh, in good natural alcohol based drink, like a good organic wine or again, like a bunch of bitters and herbs and spices and lemon juices and and extracts that are mixed into some kind of a cocktail. And then uh, you, you of course, get a little bit of the stress-relieving properties of the alcohol in many cases in many cultures, such as the Blue Zones. It's consumed with people smiling, laughing, you know, in the evening, during dinner. It's a little bit of a social lubricant. And then, uh, you know, ethanol is somewhat toxic, right? But there's this concept of hormesis. Things that could kill you in large amounts are actually good for you in small amounts and allow the cells to become more resilient, cause you to produce more of your own endogenous antioxidants or allow your cells to be able to protect themselves a little bit more efficiently. We know that getting out in the sunlight and experiencing UVA and UVB radiation in large amounts is problematic and can be carcinogenic, but in small amounts is actually really good and is anti-carcinogenic. We know if you sit in a cold tub for four hours, you're probably going to get sick sitting in the ice for four hours just because your body becomes exhausted and and your adrenal gland just can't keep up with that amount of stress. But a quick cold soak for two or three minutes in the morning is amazing for nitric oxide production and immune system regulation. If you sit in the sauna for three hours, you're going to get dehydrated and mineral depleted, but small amounts can actually help you to live longer when you eat plants like uh, like quinoa or nettle or even, you know, kale. You know, a lot of these plants have built-in protective mechanisms because they don't have hooves or teeth or claws or horns that help a plant to protect itself. And if you eat large, large amounts, like giant buckets of kale in your morning smoothie and, and tons of quinoa, so you'll wind up with some gastric upset. You know, that's sparked whole movements like the paleo movement and the carnivore movement. And I don't necessarily think you need to eliminate plants, but instead by eating small amounts of them in a wide variety every day, they also have this kind of hormetic effect and what I'm getting at is I think some of the life extending properties of having alcohol on a regular basis are related to the fact that you're consuming a mild toxin in small amounts and inducing a little bit of cellular resilience. People just go the other way and go too far. 
Right. It's funny. Ryan Holiday did this whole podcast on um, how the Stoics used to add water to their wine. Like instead of just drinking all this wine, they would add water to to their yeah. wine. And I think that's... It was what, also much stronger back then. No, but I mean with everything in life, like you need to add water to your wine. It's like too much of a good thing is going to fuck you up. There's no sparkling water that's going to come anywhere near my Bordeaux, though. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the wine. <laughs> well, Ben, I mean, listen, next time you're in L.A., we got a batch Hold again. Hold on, There's... I have to ask him the main question I wanted to ask him. You can't... Well, I... you got to go quick because I got... <laughs> okay, okay, really quick. Just go. maybe He's like a five-minute note. I'm trying to lose 25 pounds. I know a lot of women have reached out. They're trying to lose 25 pounds from postpartum or they've yep. gained it in quarantine. Maybe they've gained five, 10 pounds. What do you recommend for women? Okay. What are I'll, some tips? I'll give you my three top tips. I'll try to keep this in five minutes to be sensitive to Michael's time. And then the fat loss chapter of my book has uh, 23 reasons that you cannot lose weight and what to do about it. Well, there's but, so much. I have this whole thing uh, here I wanted to get to, but I realized yeah. that there's so much to unpack with you that I have to do like a whole, we're going to do it again. I mean, we'll yeah. just, you just have to be one of those guys yeah. that like next time you come you down. Just come every yeah. time you come on. Come. I'm coming okay. with my giant suitcase okay. on the way to the airport. Um, so the top three things that I would consider, I'm going to give you my top tip that allows people to just strip fat off their bodies super fast that I do with a lot of my clients. And then two basic things before I tell you that. So the first is that I find so many people, even people who get up in the morning and go to a hard CrossFit workout or go crush the dumbbells or the kettlebells or whatever the case may be, or their soul cycle class, when you actually look at their step count during the day, you're supposed to be getting 10,000 and preferably over 15,000 steps a day to be able to get enough of what's called non-exercise activity thermogenesis to burn an appreciable amount of calories. And so many people who are even self-proclaimed recreational athletes or weekend warriors or you know exercise enthusiasts, they're getting maybe like 6,000 to 8,000 steps a day. Right, so get a step tracker and make your goal ten to fifteen thousand steps a day. I'm getting about six to, walking, to eight right now. Okay, walking so, treadmill, okay. taking all your phone calls while you're out on a walk in the park. Just move, move, move. So that's okay. number one. Number two is a lot of people are stocking up at Costco and Trader Joe's and Air One and Whole Foods with all these, you know, dark chocolate covered almonds and you know cashew kale chips and all these so-called healthy foods that are so easy to dip your hands into here and there at little points throughout the day. I'm going to go and work out. Just grab a little handful of almonds. I'm done with my workout. I got dinner an hour. I'm a little hungry. Maybe I'll just do the, the kale chips or, or just have like half of this really good raw energy bar with a spirulina in it. These things are super calorie dense. Like there are people getting in an extra thousand calories a day from their healthy packaged foods because they're so um, they're, they're so palatable, right? They're almost addictively palatable. And so be aware of how much you're shoving snacks, even healthy snacks into your gaping maw. And, 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 and my, my recommendation is have two or three square meals a day and just have like water. And that's why I have no snacks in the house. I don't have any snacks. I can't even snack if I wanted to water and gum and tea and coffee in between those meals. Okay. And then the last one is, and, and, uh, you know, I, I stay lean, super lean, like 365 days a year. And this is something I do almost every day without fail. You get up in the morning and you are in a fasted state, right? Preferably it's been anywhere from 10 to 12 hours since you've had dinner and you go out and you do about 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise. Okay. So I call this in the book, strike, shiver, stroll, get up in the morning. First thing you do 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise. The reason it's aerobic is because a, as we've established, you already have that cortisol surge when you get up. So you don't have to go out and do something super duper hard. And B, just about everybody can get up and go for a walk, right? It's not like it's something that you're going to dread doing every day. And so there's a lot of stick there. And then when you finish your fasted morning, 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercise. Is that no matcha either? Fat, like nothing? No. Well, I mean, if the matcha has coconut milk and MCT oil and butter in it, but if it's just, you know, I'll do black coffee and arguably okay. the caffeine from matcha or black coffee that doesn't have calories added to it can actually upregulate your burning of fatty acids. So you can actually have coffee before you go for this walk or green tea just without things in it like sugar and cream. And then when you finish, and th- this is the icing on the cake, literally and figuratively, You do a cold shower or a cold soak or uh, jump in a cold river or lake or ocean, but not long. Like, again, we want this to be doable every day. Two, three minutes. We do that every day. I haven't had a hot shower. I don't think we've had hot showers Uh, all quarantine, really. And then, and then that, that's, that's what you do every day. You don't have to go punish a huge meal after you can wait an hour or two to have breakfast if you want to kind of keep the fast going, but it is so effective. You wake up, fasted aerobic exercise, a little bit of caffeine is okay. Preferably outdoors, you finish up, you get cold for two or three minutes. And what does the cold do specifically? Rinse, wash, and repeat every day. The cold 
mobilizes adipose tissue. And so you burn more fatty acids and you even convert fat into what's called metabolically active brown fat. So it forces you to burn calories to heat your body back up. And it's just magical. And it's so simple. And I find most people can just do it. Just get up, go for a walk, come back, take a cold shower. What's crazy about the cold stuff is once you start doing it regularly, like you crave it. You actually don't really yeah, want get, like, the endorphin release. Yeah. Can yeah. It, I, I know we have to go, but I just have, he can just say one sentence about this. <laughs> okay. For everyone out there who's listening that's experiencing anxiety because of what's happening in the world. Um, what would you say? What's one sentence you would We're say? We're going to have to do a one whole thing. other fucking no, podcast just one, with Just this. get round it out with, with one tip. The number one thing that you can do to control stress that is 100% free, that is built into every human body, is breathing. Learn breath work. Become intimately familiar with your breath. Learn the different forms of stress. And there's a whole chapter in his book about breath work. Thank you, Michael. There is. So, yeah, breathe. We're doing that. I'm really proud of us. Yeah. No, I mean, listen, I'm not... I'm not just yanking your chain and I know it makes you uncomfortable, but your content is fire. It's amazing. I love the book and there's a lot of value. I mean, even like I am somebody that has, you know, I'm not like super into this stuff, but I'm getting more and more because I, now I can apply. I'm like, okay, here's somebody who's done it. Here's the examples. Here's the research. Like this is, it's applicable. It's not so, I mean, it's not easy to become an expert, but a lot of this stuff is very basic stuff that you said is already built in. Like you can do breath work, you can do cold, you can do exercise, like you can eat properly. Like there's all things that any human being can do if they take an interest in and educate themselves on how to do it. You're doing really, really good work. I mean, you're helping a lot of people. Like for my husband to sit down and listen and really change his entire routine has been amazing to watch. Well, because I don't like, you know what? I equate a lot of the the quacks in, in every space too, but it's like, Okay, there's a lot of people, and I'll go on a tangent. Say they're, you know, these people that go and they build a business on teaching you how to build a business. Do you know what I'm talking about? These people, yeah. and they go into, like, buy my yeah. course so I could teach you how to make do this. Million dollars, teach you how to make a million yeah, dollars. Yeah, and my thing is, like, I see all these people and they're talking and they're doing these seminars and, like, buy the course and buy the e thing and, like, buy the podcast series or buy the business series. And the first thing I do is I go and look and be like, okay, what business have they actually built? Who have they actually employed? What have they actually sold? Like, what's the product? What's the thing? And if they don't have it, I immediately. Is, is that Lamborghini rented? Yes, yeah. I, throw the, I throw it right out the window. Like, I see that stuff. And I think a lot of people are building building businesses on the idea of I can sell you how to build a business and they're not actually mm-hmm. doing the practice. So when it comes to that stuff, I, I stay very quiet. I'm like, Hey, let me show like by example, like maybe I'll build things, but I never am going and talk. And I, I don't, I just, what I don't identify is with these people that are just like selling you on the sale. Like it has right. to be tangible things that they've actually done and built. And then I'm like, okay, they're credible. And so I think you've, you've done a lot of that and you've demonstrated a lot. So to your credit, I mean like to give you a compliment, like you've done an amazing job with building great content for people. Thanks, dude. I know I said this once, but I'm not a doctor. I know we talked about some medical stuff. But sure. Just remember, I'm not a doctor. Well, that's okay. I mean. <laughs> yeah, very, very yeah. well fucking researched. Where can everyone find you? Uh, book is called Boundless. So anywhere books are sold or boundlessbooks.com. And then my website is bengreenfieldfitness.com. That's where I blog, do podcasts, articles, videos, uh, Instagram, same thing, Ben Greenfield Fitness. And your podcast, if someone wants to start on an episode, should they just go from the beginning? <laughs> I've been podcasting for 12 years, twice a week. So you forgot about that. I, I forgot you've go been back. podcasting for 12 years. Yeah, I wouldn't go back to the beginning. Just jump in wherever you want. Just scroll through some episodes that look good to you and call your name. And yeah. Oh, fuck, man. <laughs> it's a long time. All right, Ben. Got to do it again next time you're making the Anytime rounds. Anytime you want to come on. For sure. Open invite. Yeah, sweet. Thank you, brother. All right, thanks, guys.